So last night, again, we talked about the importance of being spiritual and not just religious, and how prayer is really quite practical in our relationship with God. When we pray, we are making a commitment to God, Matthew 7, 7, that we will take action ourselves to help bring about the fulfillment of that prayer. And as we walk hand in hand with God, praying and asking, seeking and knocking, we will have more answers to prayer. And as we seek to come into harmony with God's heart, we will have more answers to prayer. Living life according to his culture, not insisting upon producing our culture. Does that make sense? That's a summary of what we talked about last night. Now, are we, are we able to get the slides up on the screen? Working on it? Okay, so maybe hit this button here. There we go. Okay, thank you very much. Notice this quote. Nobody knows the author, but I think it's pretty good. Would you read it with me? That quote at top. Extraordinary acts of God begin with ordinary acts of obedience. Isn't that interesting? We want God to move in our churches. We want God to move in the world and do extraordinary things. But are we willing, Matthew 7, 7, are we willing to put forth the effort to, to put forth the obedience that God is asking us to give to pave the way for him to do those extraordinary acts? Culture is not, isn't always bad. Many times culture can be good. But culture can also get in the way of the Holy Spirit. And it can become a convenient way to ignore what God wants us to do. So this morning, as we continue our Bible study about prayer and spirituality, I want to speak with you about this important subject of obedience. Notice 2 Chronicles 7.14. Here's our text for the weekend. It says that if we pray, it says, my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. Notice in this verse there is a condition to answered prayer. We, we talk about prayer and we should. We should be engaged in prayer. But prayer is based, the foundation of prayer is based on obedience. It says in many places in scripture that without obedience God cannot answer our prayers. It would be like a child coming to you, wanting you to give them more money when they already wasted the money you just gave them. You won't continue to give that child money like that until they learn to be responsible with the funds that you have given to them. Because you'd be teaching them negligence. You'd be teaching them to be lazy, to be selfish. And so God, as our Heavenly Father, wants to give us great things. But he can't give the great extraordinary acts he longs to give on a disobedient people who refuse to move in the direction he wants to go. So we must continually ask the question, Lord, what is it that you are wanting to do in our world today? It's very easy for us to seclude ourselves into identity groups where we feel comfortable but God calls us out of our comfort on a regular basis. He asks David to go kill a giant. He asks Samson to go destroy a temple. He asks Noah to build an ark. He, he's, he's always asking people like Abraham to step out and do something that seems at times ridiculous. But God says, I want you to do this because through this I'm going to deliver my people. Moses used a rod. So many ways in the Bible that God moved that were different than what people thought. So we must, as, as people, be open to what God wants us to do. Christianity has always been open-minded. True Christianity has always been open-minded. On the way here yesterday, I saw a billboard that was sponsored by a group called freedomfromreligion.org. And the billboard just simply, simply said... In science, we trust. Big letters. And so on the way here, I was thinking about that, and I was saying how ironic it is that they have the freedom of speech and of the press to publish a big billboard like that, denying God, 
And that right was given them by Christian men who didn't want anyone to impinge the right of a person to express themselves. So here are Christian people who are broad-minded and noble and saying, we want all people to have the freedom of choice and to have a mind to, to think and act, even if it goes against what we believe. So they decry the very God and the very religion that gave them the right to believe and to say what they want to say. How ironic is that? But true Christianity is always open-minded. It's always saying, how can I reach those people? How can I bring the gospel message to this culture? How can I be relevant in a world in which I live right now? How can I talk to those people? You know, when I go speak to young people, I kid you not, when I go speak to, to young people, and they're getting younger every day as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> when I go speak to young people, I pray for the gift of tongues. Because the gift of tongues is the gift of communication. Lord, help me to know how to speak to this generation. Because their culture is different than my culture. They live with atrocities and fears I never even dreamed of when I was a kid. So Lord, how can I speak to those people? We don't want to become a light under a basket. Didn't Jesus say something about that? We want to become a light that is easily recognized as a light so that we can share the gospel with people. And that means being obedient. I want you to stop and think about it. You know, Samson had trouble with obedience. He, uh, he struggled with a few things. He didn't like the fact that God told him not to cut his hair. Now, this was his personal challenge. God didn't say that to everybody. He didn't tell every Jew to not get a haircut. But he said, Samson, you will never cut your hair. Why? Because that's a symbol between you and me that you belong to me so that everybody will know that you are my servant. Whenever they see you in your hair, they will say, oh, I'm, that's God's servant. That's Samson. Better not mess with him. You better listen to what he says because he is God's man. But, you know, sometimes we get tired of being particular and peculiar and special. Sometimes we want to be like everybody else. You know, Israel fell into that when they said, we want a king, you know. Sometimes carrying that cross is something that, that we don't want to do. And Samson wrestled with that. So Delilah shows up one day later in his life, and she finally entices him to do the one thing that he shouldn't do, but that a big part of him wanted to do because he didn't like carrying all that hair around. And so finally he gave in. And the result of it was a terrible tragedy. He was captured. He became just like every other man. He got what he wanted. But then after he got it, he didn't think it was so great. And after a while, he began to pray, and he prayed in a prayer of, of confession and repentance, and he said, Lord, I'm sorry. And then when they brought him into that big temple with over 3,000 enemies of God there in that place, and they, they, the, the servant positioned him according to his request between the two main pillars, he prayed right there and he said, Lord, just this one time, restore my strength that I might glorify your name. Amen. And then that day, it says at the end of his life that Samson destroyed more at the end of his life than he had done the rest of his life. There's that promise, you know, that says God will restore the years that the locusts have eaten Amen. if we repent and if we say, I'm willing to be obedient. And there was Jonah. You know, Jonah had a couple of things going on. He didn't like the people in Nineveh all that well. They had, in fact, the Ninevites had quite the reputation for cruelty. And so he wasn't excited about going there. There was fear on the one hand because here he is going to preach them to, to really mean cruel people and say, repent, you know, and I'm sure he could just envision himself being the object of their wrath and having the latest torture administered to his body, you know. So that part of him wasn't there. But the other part of him was 
as we read the rest of Jonah, it says he had a feeling that if he did go and tell them to repent, that they would repent, and then that would make him look silly. So Jonah ran away. Isn't that silly? Talk about silly, right? Running away from God. Yeah, give that a try. Let's see how that works for you. Where can I flee from your spirit, David said. So he goes and gets on a ship headed for Tarshish, trying to get as far away from Nineveh as he can. He gets on board that ship, and while he's there, down in the bottom of that ship, a storm, the Lord brings a storm, and it's such a terrible storm that those seasoned sailors didn't know how to get out of it. And they're throwing everything overboard to lighten the ship and to try to keep that thing afloat. And Jonah, deeply convicted, he knew that this was no ordinary storm, and he knew what had just happened. I mean, really stop and let this sink in, brothers and sisters. What blessings have we forfeited? Because we, me, you, have been disobedient. What blessings? You know, the story of Achan is not just an old story. It's still relevant today. So here he is. He comes up and he says there, it's my fault. And they look at it. Can you imagine uh, somebody today saying, it's my fault that we have this big storm going on right now? And, but he said, it's my fault. And they said, well, why do you say that? He said, well, I'm running away from God. So they threw him overboard. <laughs> you know, they, he, he told them, throw me overboard. So they throw him overboard. There's a song, let's see if I can remember, it goes like this. Uh, While Jonah was a-sitting by a tree, God said, Jonah, will you please go preach for me? But Jonah shook his head, tried to run away instead, but the Lord had other plans, as you will see. Well, Jonah's ship was battered by a gale. He said, fellas, better throw me o'er the rail. But as Jonah hit the sea, he was sorry as can be. For he became the dinner of a whale. <laughs> and then the song goes on to say, Oh, I'd rather be on the outside looking in than to be on the inside looking out. While Jonah was inside, he overcame his pride, and then in prayer to God he did confide. Oh, I'd rather be on the outside looking in than to be on the inside looking out. The whale dumped him on the beach. Jonah said, Now, Lord, I'll preach. I'm so glad I'm on the outside looking in. <laughs> and when he became obedient, when he confessed, then God brought him even closer to Nineveh than he was when he first ran away. I heard one preacher put it this way. He said, God's got such a great sense of humor. He said, can you imagine some fisherman throwing his net into the sea and up comes this big, gigantic, whale-like fish and vomits Jonah up out on the beach? I mean, your eyes are like... You know, and Jonah gets up, you know, and gets the seaweed off his body, you know, and cleaning everything off, and he sees that fisherman, and he says, repent. <laughs> and the preacher said, well, what would you do? <laughs> so he repented, you know. So Jonah goes into Nineveh, now an obedient child, and God blessed his, his sermon. God blessed his, his testimony, and the whole city, repented so that God did not destroy that city. Well, then you got Elijah. Elijah was sent to Ahab and Jezebel with a message. There shall be no dew nor rain until the Lord speaks through me again. And then out from their presence he goes. They were so stunned and so shocked under the presence of God that they didn't have the presence of mind to arrest him. And so off he goes for three and a half years until all Israel knew that Baal and his ability, so-called ability, to bring rain to crops was just a fable. And after that amount of time, Jonah finally appears to Obadiah, who happens to be one of my favorite characters in the Bible. It's different Obadiah than the one who wrote the book of Obadiah, but this guy was amazing because he kept the church alive. That's a whole sermon. He kept the church alive during a time of apostasy. And so as he was keeping the church alive, what God chose to send Elijah to Obadiah. And he said, now go tell your master Ahab that I'm ready to talk to him. And Obadiah said, I've tried to follow God. Why are you punishing me? If I go tell him that I found you, he's going to kill me. He said, no, he won't. He said, just go tell him I'm ready to visit with him. And so finally, Elijah meets up with Ahab. And Ahab is so typical of our time. He turns to the man of God and says, you are the troubler of Israel, you know. 
And anytime people stand up for God and for his truth, they're always going to be looked upon as the troublers of the society, you know. And so he said, and that's not me. He said, you are the troubler of Israel, you and your wife Jezebel. And he says, do this, call all the people of Israel together at Mount Carmel, and we'll have a showdown, and we'll see who the real God is. And so off Ahab goes, and he tells Jezebel, every, she, she's all upset and unhappy. She rallies all her troops together, over 800 priests, and they come there to that top of that mountain, and they put on a big display calling for Baal to, to show his might and power and to throw fire, and it says Elijah's watching them carefully to make sure they don't do any trick there, you know. Finally, they warned themselves out. And the very first thing that Elijah did, he didn't get up there and pray first. It's very important that we understand what he did. The first thing that he did was he repaired the altar. A very powerful, symbolic statement. We need to return to God. We need to return to what God wants us to be and what God wants us to do. Remember that prayer? Can you say it with me? I want to be... What you want me to be, I want to do what you want me to do, and I want to go where you want me to go. And when Elijah built that altar, he was basically saying that prayer. We're going to restore the worship of God, the way God wants us to do it, not the way ultra-conservatives want us to do it, not the way ultra-liberals want us to do it. We want to do worship the way God wants us to do it in our present context in which we live. Not trying to resurrect an ancient way of worship that has no relevance to our people or trying to invent something that has never been that will also have no relevance. The, the truth of God has always been called present truth. Present truth. That's the truth given in a present context. This is the way God has always tried to reach the people. And so Elijah built the altar. And then he knelt down and he prayed. And the Bible says the word in Hebrew is a lightning bolt. Very significant because Baal was always shown with a lightning bolt in his hand. And so God said, here is the true God. I am the, I am the God of the lightning. I am the God of the rain. And then God sent an abundant rain after that experience there on Mount Carmel. Obedience is one of the most foundational, most important prerequisites to answered prayer. And this is why last night I asked you to search your heart. I know you want more answers to prayer in your life and in your church. Some of you have children that you need answers to prayer for. Some have grandchildren. Some have very important things in your life that you need answers for prayer. Seek, seek to be obedient to God. Be obedient to God. Obedience is not something that is popular usually, but it's essential. It's essential. Without obedience, there can be no blessing from God. Psalm 66, 18, let's just review a few things. Psalm 66, 18, it says, If I cherish sin, my prayers will not be heard. The old King James says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. It means to, to cling to. Now, everybody struggles with sin in our life. That's why we're called sinners. Everybody's wrestling to become better and, and, and more Christ-like every day. So it's not talking about the absence of sin in your life. It's saying if you cling to that, if you cherish it, if you continue to coddle it in your life, it says God can't hear your prayers. Now, I don't know about you. I think I do know about you. That's why you're here. But we say it that way. But I think that Anything that impedes God answering my prayers is pretty important. I need to know about it. I need to deal with it. Would you agree with that? Because my kids need my prayers. My grandkids need my prayers. My church needs my prayers. And we need to know that our prayers are being heard by God unimpeded. Amen? Amen. And so it's important that we be willing to ask the question, how can I be obedient? Now, this whole this 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 thing that we could easily do five or six hundred sermons probably on obedience. You know we don't have that kind of time. But what I'm trying to get across to you is being obedient the way God wants us to be obedient. You get newsletters, you get websites, you get people who come from all over the place telling you that that you got to be obedient like this, you know, like this, and they have a very narrow definition of what it means to be obedient according to their gospel. 
There's, we, in the Adventist church, and not, I don't know whether you know this or not, but in every denomination, there are groups who arise and who say, this is the way to be a good Baptist. This is the way to be a good Catholic. This is the way to be a good Pentecostal. And so we have people who stand up and say, this is the way to be a good Adventist. Well, I'm not going to give you a list like that. Because Galatians 5, 22 and 23 is what it really means to be a good Adventist. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control. Those are what it really means to, to really be walking in the Spirit, to have those things. It's not about, you know, uh, let me put it to you this way. I'm a first-generation Adventist, as I said last night. After I had been in the church just a few years, I, I could tell you what generation of Adventist you are based on how far you think you can go in the lake on a hot summer day. <laughs> on Sabbath. My wife's grandparents, see, my wife is like a fifth or sixth generation Adventist. I haven't counted it up lately. She's related to Ellen White. She's a a great niece, great, great niece of Ellen White. She's related to Frank Belden, who, a hymn writer in, in our church in the past. And she has, all, she has a long Adventist heritage, all right? So she marries a first-generation Adventist. You're going to have to talk to God about that someday. <laughs> and so, but, so anyway, she, her, her grandparents, both raised in the church, uh, they would never let themselves get any deeper in the water on a hot Sabbath day than just their ankles. Because anything more than that was breaking the Sabbath. Her parents wouldn't go farther than their knees. Their generation had progressed to the kneecap at that point. All right? In my generation, my wife's generation, we could walk up to our waist, but you better not go beyond that because that could be called swimming. And then that's definitely crossing the line. But my kids, they just dive in. <laughs> now, the thing is, where does it say anything in the Bible about how far you can go into the water on a hot Sabbath day? And by the way, who said it was okay to go on a 12-mile hike on Sabbath and get that hot to start with? I think that's an apocryphal book, Brother Mark. Yeah. It's in, it's in the book of Joshua. As soon as their feet touch the water, it parts. I see. <laughs> we got trouble right here on the front row. All right. Yeah. See, culture, culture has a way of becoming part of the Ten Commandments. So that when you break a cultural rule, you feel like you're breaking a law of God because you were taught to do it that way from the time you were a small child. But that doesn't mean that that's the way to do it. Do you know why we have church at 11 o'clock on Sabbath? Do you know why? Well, we got it from the Sunday churches. Do you know why they have church at 11 o'clock on Sunday? It's because of cows. Because of cows. When the Christian message came to Europe, many of them had cows and other animals at home. And so when they became converted Christians and they knew they needed to meet, they had to calculate how long it would take them to get from their farm to the church. And then they would stay for church and have lunch and visit. And then they needed to get back for the chores. So 11 o'clock became the hour of worship because of cows. And we still do it. And most of you don't have any cows. That's not true. We have sacred cows all over. Yeah. You'll have to forgive Mark. He's a preacher, and we've known each other for a long time. He, he feels like he should be up here talking to you right now. Keep it up. I'm going to bring you up here. So... We want to be obedient in the way God wants us to be obedient. You see, what if God, because of, because of your, your city where you live, what if it was better for you to have church at 10 o'clock in the morning or 1 o'clock in the afternoon in order 
to be able to reach the people for Christ? What if that was the case? Are you following me here? See, we're supposed to be following Jesus, not culture. We're supposed to be following Jesus, not ritual or tradition. What does he want us to do? I already told you I had to change a lot of culture to become an Adventist. My family pretty much discontinued all connection with me for about 20 years. So you have to forgive me because I do get emotional when I think about that and when I think about how unwilling the people I joined are to change any little thing. It feels like betrayal to me. We need to listen to God's voice in his word and not what people say. What does God say? Most of us haven't been to a Bible study group in so long we can't remember what it was. We need to get together to study the Bible to listen to what he says in the 66 books we call the Bible. And then we need to pray and ask God to give us an obedient heart. And then do what he asks us to do. And then we can expect that great things are going to happen. Because God wants to bless obedient people. It says the Lord hears the prayers of the righteous. That's those who are trying to, to follow him. Now, this guy here is Frank. Frank was raised as a Seventh-day Adventist. That's his little boy right outside the Adventist school there in Spokane, Washington, where I pastored for quite a while. Frank was a, a faithful young man growing up with his mom and dad. He told me he, he loved to go to Sabbath school and church and and he went to school in College Place there at Rogers Elementary School when he was a boy. But as with many kids, he lost his way at some point. And then it became easier to stay away from God and to stay away from the church. You know, it's always easier to keep doing what you're doing. In fact, you might want to write this down. I, got, I don't even remember. Oh, yeah, now I do remember. I got it from Mark Batterson, and he said this. And I don't know where he got it, but I, I heard it from him. He said... People never change until the pain of change is less than the pain of staying the same. People never change until the pain of change is less than the pain of change of staying the same. And uh, so Frank, uh, the Lord allowed him, because God loved him so much, the Lord allowed him to, to have some pretty heavy issues arise in his life. And it was at that point that he said, I need to find God. I need to go back to God. And all the studies I've done through all the years about why people come to Christ, it's almost always right after a crisis. Almost always. And churches, as a group, often don't become spiritual and on fire until after some problem has arisen that has caused them great pain. Isn't that a shame? And so Frank met with these very difficult problems. His, his marriage was falling apart, and he was having issues with his children and different things, and his business wasn't going well. Frank um, manufactures popcorn. He gets popcorn from the farmers, and then he pops the popcorn with his... He's got a little, a little factory there in Spokane. He makes all kinds of varieties of, of popcorn with flavorings and all kinds of things. He packages them up and takes them around and sells them. Some of the big chain stores out there carry his product. And Frank was having problems keeping that going. And so he just felt like his whole life was coming apart. And about that time is when we met, he, he came to church. I didn't know him, but he shows up at church. And uh, we got acquainted. And he said, would you come to my home and, and visit me? I said, I'd be happy to. So I went to his home, met his wife, met his children. And we started studying the Bible together. And many times as we'd be studying something, whatever it was, the, the state of the dead or the Sabbath or the second coming of Jesus, Frank many times would have a tear in his eye as he's reading this, and he would wipe the tear away, and he would say something to me like, uh, he says, I know this stuff. He says, I know this stuff. Why, why do I not obey? And so I talked to Frank. I said, at one point, after a while, I said, Frank, 
you know, we've, we've talked about the gospel. I said, but can you say to me, have you really given your life to Jesus? He said, I've been afraid to. He says, I don't know what will happen. And I said, you can trust him, Frank. You can trust him. Jesus only has good plans in store for you. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. And I quoted that verse to him, and I said, Frank, why don't we just kneel right here in your living room? And his wife took his hand, and she says, I need to do this too. So we knelt right there in the living room, and Frank and his wife repeated the prayer of surrender. After me, I, I would lead them in prayer, and they repeated that prayer, and it was a true, honest statement on their part. They accepted Jesus. They cried. They hugged each other. And that was the beginning of good things in their life. Things started getting better when Frank started going back to church and started putting his trust in God. His business was still a big issue. It wasn't going well. And then one day, Frank said to me, Pastor, he says, I know I should be returning tithe. He said, but I simply don't have it. He said, everything I make is going to pay a bill. He says, I'm not even taking a salary home. He says, I'm, I'm just paying bills. He said, but I know I should be returning tithe. And I said, well, Frank, what do you want to do about it? He said, I want to be obedient. He said, can I trust God if I return tithe? He said, Pastor, if I return this tithe, I literally won't be able to pay a whole bunch of people. He said, if I do this, can I trust God? I said, Frank, you can trust God. I said, I don't say that on my own authority. I said, the Bible says, return the tithes and offerings, and I will pour you out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And he said, okay. So that Sabbath, he put several thousand dollars into the offering, which was his tithe at that point. And I kid you not, this is one of those stories that should be written in a book someplace, but this is exactly what happened. Frank, that week, got a letter in the mail from somebody who owed him three times the amount of money that he put in that offering that week. And he, with a letter that said, Frank, I have not been right with you. I've had this money and I have withheld it from you. And he said, he said I, I want to do the right thing. And so he paid Frank what he owed him. When you're obedient, you give God the freedom to bless you. And, and we as individuals and as families and as whole churches sometimes, we need to be obedient to what we know God is calling us to do. A ton of prayer, Edwin Lewis Cole once said, will never produce what an ounce of obedience will. Because you can pray until you're blue in the face, but if your heart is far from God and you're not being obedient to God, God cannot answer your prayers. If you want to see more answers to prayer, Seek to be a spiritual person. Seek to come into harmony with God's culture and seek to be obedient. Do what you know God is asking you to do. And as I briefly mentioned last night and in, in my story of Samson today, sometimes the things that God asks us to do are as unique as you as an individual. It may not be something that he asks all Adventists to do, but he's asking you to do it. Now, pastors understand this very well. Because we as pastors often restrict our lives needlessly and more severely than other people do because we are pastors. And because we need to minister to everyone and not just to a few. I had a pastor come to visit our church, a godly man, good speaker. He came to visit our church, but in that particular church where I was at, the people were a way lot more conservative than they should have been, and it was a constant a source of prayer for me it caused me to pray a lot, and it was very tricky to deal with that situation, very difficult, because they weren't relevant to their community, and it was really hard to get somebody to show up at that church from the community, because it would be like you going to a monastery to be a monk. That's how it felt to those people. They were so out of touch with their, their city, they were like the Amish in Indiana. Something that people talked about and pointed to, but you wouldn't want to live that way, you know. And so 
Remember, I started this last night by saying my purpose in life is to what? That's why I repeat it. <laughs> my purpose in life is to attract people to Jesus. You remember the prayer I prayed, Lord, help me to be as smart as a tree, because they always point in the right direction. So I want my life to be attractive to Jesus. I don't want my life to drive people away. I don't want to be such a laughing stock that people look at me and go, ugh, what kind of God does he follow? You know? But neither do I want to be crazy and not even be, let there be a difference between the way I live and the way the world lives, all right? So we need, that's why in each city, in each country, each state, we need to ask ourselves, what's, what's relevant here? And how do I live here? And so Frank comes to church. I rebaptized him. I, re I baptized his wife because he sought to be obedient. And then his prayers were answered. As we think about Christ's object lessons, page 143, she says there are conditions to the fulfillment of God's promises. And prayer can never take the place of duty. Many are forfeiting the condition of acceptance with the Father. We need to examine closely the deed of trust wherewith we approach God. If we are disobedient, we bring to the Lord a note to be cashed when we have not fulfilled the conditions that would make it payable to us. We present to God his promises and ask him to fulfill them when by so doing he would dishonor his own name. So if we want more answers to prayer, then we need to seek to be obedient to what God asks us to to be, to do, and to go. Amen? Amen? Amen. Prayer will become effective, A.W. Tozer once said, when we stop using it as a substitute for obedience. My wife and I once knew a lady who was having an illicit affair with another man. And when we talked with her about it, because we'd known her for a long time, and so we were able to talk with her on that level, and... We, we gently asked her, you know, you know you're, you're a Christian lady and you're, you're on the books in the church and you go to church every week. And she says, well, I'm still praying. But that's not what God wanted. If you read Isaiah chapter 1, and we didn't read every verse that I've had up on the screen here this morning, but Isaiah chapter 1, he says, you draw near me with your lips, but your heart is what? See, we pray to God with our mouth. We pray to God with our lips, so to speak. Even if it's a silent prayer, we're trying to speak to God. But where is our heart? Is our heart with God? Prayer will become effective when we stop using it as a substitute for obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, if you really love me, you will, what? Obey my commandments. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40, all of God's laws are based in his love. So to be obedient to God is to love, to love our fellow man. I, we don't have time to open up every avenue of all this stuff, but many years ago I did a study on perfectionism and, per, and being perfect. And there's that verse there, you know, in Matthew chapter 5, it says, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. If you read that in context, it's not talking about behavior. It's talking about loving your neighbor. And when Ellen White talks about the character of Christ being perfectly reproduced and then Jesus will come, you've heard that quoted quite a bit probably. She's not talking about behavior when she says that. Don't take my word for it. You go look it up. She's talking about loving our neighbor. And she says that is the character of Christ to love our neighbor, to stop being self-centered and self-focused and to start seeing how can I be a blessing to the people around me. That is the character of Christ. In Acts chapter 10, 38, it says he was constantly going about seeking to be a blessing. And when, if we have the character of Christ, that's how we will be remembered. They were constantly going about seeking to be a blessing. When Ellen White died, there were three funeral services that were held. One of them was in Elmshaven on the lawn of, the, of their property. And neighbors, hundreds of neighbors showed up from all around. Why? Because she regularly got into her, her buggy with her nurse Sarah and she drove from home to home, sometimes with cookies. So 
Health reformers, take note. <laughs> Sometimes with cookies to her neighbors, and she would hand out these cookies to the kids, and then she would talk to the moms and dads, and she would ask them, how are you? Are you well? How can I help you? And she would talk to them about Jesus. And they said she always spoke so lovingly to us about Jesus. And she prayed for us. And they all said, we will miss her. So I had, uh, we, we recently moved to our new district, but I was living in a little town called Ording, Washington, not too far from another little town called Puyallup, not too far from a bigger town called Tacoma, which is not too far from Seattle, for those of you who want to know where Ording actually is. All right? So we lived in a cul-de-sac. As soon as we moved there, I started praying for my neighbors. Jim and Janet over here, right over here was, they moved away a few years ago, I'll tell you his name in a minute, um, Lee and his wife, Nina. And then over here was Shane and Michelle. And over on this corner was Scott and Jennifer, our little cul-de-sac. I started praying for them. And in Christmas time, I would make up brownies and take them brownies. Did you know Ellen White doesn't condemn chocolate? Just a little footnote. <laughs> Somebody asked me one time, they said, Pastor, how come Ellen White never condemned chocolate? I said, I don't know. Probably she liked it. I don't know. <laughs> but she never says anything bad about it, right? So, uh, so I would take them brownies. And then I took over this big plate of brownies over to my neighbor here, to Lee and his wife, because they had four teenage daughters, which meant they had 16 girls all the time in their home. And so there was a big gathering of girls at their home on this particular weekend, and so I made a big platter of brownies and went over and knocked at the door. And when he answered the door, I said, you know, I said, I'm bringing over this big plate of brownies, but I never stopped to think that maybe you don't like brownies. He said, duh, took the brownies <laughs> And so we would take them bread, and, and uh, sometimes I would visit with them on the lawn, and they would tell me stuff, and I would pray with them. I prayed for my neighbors here and my neighbors there. Prayer is a great opening wedge. Amen. And I would just pray for these people. One day I come home at Christmas time, a different Christmas, and my neighbor Jim is up on his roof putting his lights on his house. And I get out of the car, and a voice loud enough for everybody in the entire neighborhood to hear, he says, Pastor, pray for me. And I said, I will, I do. What do you want me to pray about? He said, I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> and he wasn't kidding, he was afraid of heights. So I said, I will, Jim, and I prayed for him right there. And I like to do pastel painting. And I, I do that once in a while, and I don't have somebody to give it to, so I take it to a neighbor. Hopefully they like it before they take it to the Goodwill, I don't know. But I, I made this picture, and I took it over to Michelle, because they had just moved in, and I said, uh, Michelle, I don't know if you even like stuff like this. I said, but I just wanted to do something to welcome you to the neighborhood. Oh, she absolutely loved it. She just thought it was the best thing ever, and she put it up right above their fireplace, you know, and all that. But, but just see, if you're going to pray for your neighbors, that's a, then what are you going to do for your neighbors? How are you going to help them? How are you going to let them help you? The way I got to know Lee was I had a big stump in my yard that needed to come out. I'd this terrible, ugly tree, awful tree, chopped it all down, started digging all around it, and uh, did what I could to get it out. And oh, how I wished I'd had my tractor that, that I'd sold before we moved there. But anyway, I wasn't able to get that stump out by myself. Chopped it around, it, dug around it as much as I could. It had a big old taproot underneath it. And right about then, I'm thinking about dynamite guys, but I lived in a neighborhood. <laughs> so I said, no, I'm not going to do that, you know. So, so but I, I saw my... He was home, Lee was home, and he had this big old 4x4 four four Ford sitting over there, that big three-quarter ton thing. And I said, oh, you know, this is my opportunity. So I wrapped my chain around that thing and pulled it out into the, to the driveway. I went over and knocked on his door, and I said, uh, Lee, I said, I, I need a little help. And he said, how can I help you? I said, you know, take a look out there. I said, you see that stump? I need somebody to pull that thing out. You know, what? every guy likes to do stuff like that. <laughs> You know, he, he said, I'll be right out, you know. So he gets his keys, comes right out, turns up that diesel, you know, and comes backing up there and 
hooks up to the chain. I mean, he didn't have to even break an idol. He just pulled that thing right out of the, right out of the ground. And he came out, shook my hand, and that was the beginning of a great friendship with him. Sometimes loving your neighbor is letting them love you. And he who would have friends must show himself friendly, and sometimes that means letting them do something for you. Well, the time came when we moved to our new district, and we were, we were loading up everything. All the neighbors knew we were moving, and we were loading up everything. And I'm only telling you this because I feel an obligation to you that if I'm going to ask you to do stuff, you need to know that I try to do it too. And so I'm, I'm loading up everything. Our last little bit of stuff is going in the truck. They must have been watching because first they, the, this neighbor, Lee and his wife, came out, and then Jim and Janet came out, and then Michelle and Shane came out, and they all came over there, and they started to cry. And they said, we're going to miss you. We wish you wouldn't leave. They said, who's going to pray for us now? Being like Jesus isn't about how vegan you are. It's about how loving you are. It's not about how you wear your hair or how long your skirts are. It's about how long your patience is and about whether you really care about the people around you. The character of Christ is not going to be written down on a to-do list. It's about an attitude toward the people who live around you and who come to your churches with you. To be like Jesus is to be a lover and a giver, to be generous in every sense of that word with the people who live near you and around you. So I was praying, praying, praying. I was, I was asking God. I had first learned about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's another whole long weekend right there. But I was praying, praying. This was back in 1989. Some of you may not even be able to remember that day. But it was way back in 1989. And I was, I was praying so earnestly to be baptized with the true baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not some cultural thing or some churchy thing. I wanted what the Bible says and what Ellen White taught and what our pioneers believed and I'm saying a lot of stuff to try to help you realize I wasn't trying to be crazy so I, I wanted to be filled with God's spirit I was praying and praying and praying for that and in the midst of praying for that one one day I was on my knees praying and the Lord brought that yo-yo to my mind that's a bowling ball yo-yo he brought that to my mind I hadn't thought of that well, what is that, uh, 24 years. I hadn't thought about that in 24, I was 10 years old. And I had gone as a part of our grade school to a bowling tournament. I was on the team for our grade school. And I, was, I went to Little Rock, Arkansas, to the, where we were living. We lived in Arkansas at the time. And I went to that, that tournament, and my dad had given me a little money, and he said, if you find something that you like, he said, go ahead and get it, you know, and have a little fun. I said, all right. Very rare thing in my family. And so I had a little bit of money in my pocket. I saw that bowling ball yo-yo, and I said, boy, I'd really like to have that. It looks like fun. It looked cool. So I paid for it, and I started playing with it. It was time to go, and we were, you know, some of us were getting ready to go and get on the bus, and I was playing with it and playing with it. Well, I was playing a little too hard with it. And when I sent it out, it flipped off my finger, and it hit the ground, and it broke in half. So I did a terrible thing. I put it back in the box, and I went back, and I said, this is defective. Can I replace it? I lied, and I stole. Isn't that right? That's what I did. And I hadn't thought about it in 24 years. And here I am asking God to fill me with his spirit. And what did he choose for me. He said, do you remember that bowling ball yo-yo? And right away, I felt a pain. And here's, here's the thing. We pretty much always remember the details of the bad things we do. And I remembered the, the name of the bowling alley. I remembered how much I paid for it. I remembered the whole thing. So I sat down and I calculated 24 years of 10% interest on a dollar and 50 cents. 
and it came to over $88. And so I wrote out a check for 88 and some cents with an explanatory letter, and I sent it off to the bowling alley. I said, I want to make restitution for what I had done. God made that clear. That was my test. He made that very clear. Sent it off, and boy, did I feel better. I felt better. I knew I had done what God asked me to do, and I felt so good. I felt clean in my heart. I knew I had done the right thing. And so when I sent that off, I kind of forgot about it. I was just grateful to have that off my chest. And I felt clear to pray for God's anointing of His Spirit in my life. Two weeks later, I get a letter back from a lady that is one of the owners, or the wife of the owner, I guess, at that bowling alley at the time. She said, I'm sure you can imagine that, that the original owners have passed away. They sold the bowling alley to other people who sold it to us. So when we got, the, this is what the letter said, when we got your letter and read it, we couldn't believe what you had done for us, that you had sent this money to us. She said, nobody does that. And she said, we, we couldn't believe that you did this to be right with God. And she said, we felt that this money was holy money and that we should not put it into the bowling alley. She said, we took the money and we gave it to an orphanage. We hope that's okay with you. And I wrote her back a note and I said, that's totally fine. That's totally okay with me. What I was ashamed of and embarrassed by, God used to be a testimony to those people. And my heart was clear. And God began to do amazing things in answer to prayer as a result of that test that he brought into my life. And he will do the same thing for you. He will test you, and then he will bless you. If you, if you are faithful to the test and obey what he asks you to do, he will bless you. I have no doubt in my mind about that at all. In Revelation chapter 2, as we mentioned last night, it says, return to your first love. 1 John 1, 9, confess your sins. Revelation 3, 20, open your heart and let Jesus come in. How do we do that? There are two additional steps. Remove the sinful things from your life. I'm going to just say it because it's true. Some, some people shouldn't even own a computer. They can't control it. It's just like a TV has been for generations. Some people shouldn't own a TV because they can't control it. Some people have books in their home that need to be tossed out. I did when I gave my life to Jesus. I had, I had literature in my possession that I needed to get rid of. It needed to go. I had music that needed to go. And music is very powerful. Some, some of you here perhaps have music that you just really shouldn't have. It, you need to get rid of it. I had an elder in my church who came to me one day and there were crazy things going on in his home. His garage door would just go up and down, all, the, all on its own. His wife's sewing machine would start up and then stop all by itself. You know, he thought, well, am I having some kind of weird electrical problems? And he had an electrician come out, and he says, your elect electrical stuff is fine. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. And lights would go on in the night and then go off. And, and finally, he began to realize, this is, this is a spiritual attack. And so he came to me, and he said, Pastor... Have you ever heard of anything like this before? I said, oh, yeah. I said, I definitely have. I said, didn't you just go to Peru on a mission trip? I said, he said, yeah. I said, did you buy anything while you were there and bring it home? He said, yeah. He says, I, I brought home some souvenirs. I said, can I see them? And he said, sure. And so he brought them out, and he had some necklaces which were used in uh, paganistic worship uh, uh, he didn't realize that, but I recognized them because of things I had seen before. And I said, these are fetishes. These are things that are used in satanic worship. I said, when you brought those things into your home, you gave the devil permission to come in with them. And I said, you need to burn those things. And so we took them out. He said, I'll do it right now. He took them out, and he put them in his trash container outside, and he burned them. And uh, we prayed, and we rededicated his home, and all those things went away. 
Remember what Ephesians 6 says, verse 12 to 18, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. The, the devil is trying to hinder your prayers. He's trying to keep your prayers from being heard. And when we allow sinful things to remain a part of our life, our prayers are being hindered. God is not able to bless us when we allow things that we know are wrong to remain a part of our life. Then after we've removed those things, Romans 12, 21 says, we bring in good things because it says that as we, as we overcome evil with good, then we are, we are coming into harmony with what God wants for us. You have to get rid of friends sometimes and find new friends. You need to get rid of activities and find new activities. Get rid of, get rid of sinful possessions and replace them with good things. And as you do this, as you, as you break down the idols and, and tear down the altars and then repair the altar of the Lord, God will bless you and your prayers will be heard. Please don't think this is silly. This is deadly in earnest. Your prayers are needed for the salvation and the benefit of many people. So this is my son, our oldest son, Kyle. You recognize him, Donna? He's kind of an older boy now, huh? We knew Donna years ago when our kids were little. This is his wife, Margie, Donna. Uh, he looked kind of happy, doesn't he? Yeah. He's the math teacher in the family, and he teaches high school math, uh, something I never, ever aspired to do. <laughs> and uh, he had some rocky times. No need to go into all the details, but you've had experiences too. For years, our, our poor boy, wrestled with the devil, and the devil had him by the throat. And we just prayed and prayed for him. And So I would like to recommend that you pray the way we prayed. We prayed very specifically, and we said, Lord, make him miserable. Don't ever let him be happy. <laughs> I'm serious. The Bible, we prayed in harmony with the Bible. It says the very last verse in Isaiah 48 says, There is no peace, says my Lord, for the wicked. And he was living a wicked life. And we said, Lord, don't ever allow him to be happy in his wickedness. Make him miserable every day, we prayed. If he puts stuff in his mouth that isn't good for him, make it taste horrible. So bad that he wants to spit it out. Whatever he does to his body that is bad and hurtful and sinful, make it hurt. Cause him to hurt and don't let him enjoy sin. And if he has bad associates, Lord, make them betray him. Cause them to turn on him. Don't let that we prayed very specifically about all of these things because we knew that those prayers were in harmony with the will of God. And then we claimed about 15 promises. We prayed every day 15 promises from the Bible about how God will reach out to the wicked and bring them back and how he will put love in their heart for God and how he will restore the child back to faith. And we just claimed those promises over and over again. Years went by, and at this particular point in time, he was. we had no idea where he was. You know, when you have a son that's misbehaving in your home still, half of the people you know will say, kick him out, and the other half of the people will say, you better not. And uh, so, but you have, to, you have to wait for the voice of the Lord. And my wife and I were divided over this. She wanted to kick him out, and I said, I'm not ready to do that yet. I said, because when we kick him out, we have broken all ties at that point, and we have no more influence over him. I said, I know it's hard, but, as, but until the Lord says, I said, will you agree with me that we won't ask him to leave until we know that that's what God wants? Amen. And she said, okay, I can agree with that. So we prayed that God would, would make it clear. Well, God did make it clear, and one day he had been gone for about two weeks. We didn't know where he was or what he was doing. And, and uh, he came back and, uh, to get all of his stuff and everything, and I said, uh, we sat down on the porch of the home, I said, Kyle, I said, it looks to me like you don't really want to be home anymore. He said, no, Dad, I don't really want to be home. I said, so what do you got a plan? I said, do you have a plan? He said, yeah, I'm going to go live with my friend. I said, okay. And he started packing up his stuff. And I did my best to hold back my tears as I'm helping him pack his stuff up. Some of you have been there, haven't you? So I helped him take off, and he left. 
and then I went out to my wood shop because I like to work with wood and uh, canceled everything else for the rest of the day because I was in no shape to talk to anybody or do anything. So I went out there and made sawdust for a few hours. And that was the beginning of several years of not hearing from him very much or knowing too much about him. That was hard. One night we we prayed, man, I prayed and prayed and prayed. You've you've prayed. But I knew I knew my conscience was clear. You gotta have that. When your kids are at stake, you've gotta have a clear conscience. And I knew my conscience was clear, and I was praying and praying for him. And one night, about 3 o'clock in the morning, I heard the sound of his car, and I hoped and I opened the window and looked out. Sure enough, he was pulling into the driveway about 3 o'clock in the morning. I got up, put on my clothes, and he comes to the, to the door, knocks on the door, and I open the door, and he says, Dad, can I come home? I said, Kyle, you know we want you to come home. I said, but home hasn't changed. I said, it's still the way it was. He said, that's why I want to come home. And he he came in and uh, he hugged me uh, real tight. And he said, Dad, I'm tired of being the prodigal son. I said, well, we're glad to have you come in. And so Dolly, my wife, got up and we spent the rest of the wee hours of the morning talking. First thing out of his mouth when he started talking was, I don't know why I ever did this crazy stuff. He said, I was miserable every day. (laughs) Everything I tasted was horrible. and My friends let me down. And all the things we had prayed very specifically, out of his own mouth, he confirmed that God had heard every single one of those prayers. He got rebaptized. Married this beautiful girl. She loves Jesus. He now teaches at a church school, an Adventist church school. And he's doing his best to help the kids in his own words. Dad, I'm trying to help them avoid the mistakes that I made. So God is good. Brothers and sisters, in these days before Jesus comes, we must become an obedient people. But not according to some skewed philosophy, some private interpretation of Adventism. Please avoid self-appointed groups who have decided to be your conscience. They may even be employed by the church. They may even hold high positions in the church. But that does not mean that at that moment, in that way, that they are God's voice. We must listen to what the Bible says. We must follow the Bible. And for me, that also means I want to take seriously what the Spirit of Prophecy says. The whole thing. And not just a portion here or there that happens to agree with some conservative or liberal agenda. I don't want to follow agendas. I want to follow Jesus.